Okay. So ready? Oh, yeah. yeah. Turn okay. off your. Yeah, make sure you're muted. Your make sure your uh, laptop is muted. There we go. Okay. Now we're good. Excellent. Good deal. Okay. Yes. Now we're ready. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, okay, so yeah, so thank you very much for the kind invitation to come here. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I'm going to talk about something that is not in the Einstein toolkit, um, but uh, part of it is based on something in the Einstein toolkit. Uh, so I'm going to talk about Sphinx PSSN, which is uh, a new code that I've been developing with my collaborator, Stefan Rosbo from the University of Hamburg. Uh, called uh, where we do relativity with particle methods instead of uh, standard Eulerian hydrodynamics. So uh, this is the outline of the talk. So uh, first I'll quickly give an overview of what it is. And then I will try to convince you that this is actually something that is probably a good idea to actually do. Um, and uh, then I will talk a little bit about the basics of smooth particle hydrodynamics. I must admit that Stefan is the big expert on that. So um, if I mess up, it's all my fault. Uh, then I will just say a little bit about PSN. I don't think I need to say too much about it here, um, but um, I will highlight the things that are necessary to understand why uh, the next step, namely uh, that we need to couple the two methods together. And since they live, the hydrodynamics live on particles and the space uh, and the PSN lives on a grid, we have to map things back and forth. Then I will go and, and show you a few test applications trying to in convince you that this is actually working. And then I will show some uh, results from, uh, uh, well, some movies and some results from astrophysical applications to this for finest neutral star mergers that has a front collapse and spun in star mergers with a long lived remnant. Um, and then uh, some outlook and future developments needed. So, what is Sphinx BSN? As I said, Sphinx BSN is a relativistic smooth particle hydrodynamics code that is coupled to a grid based space time evolution code. Um, so this means that matter is represented by particles that move wherever the hydrodynamics and the gravity dictates them to go. Um, and space-time uh, is still represented on discrete points based on a fixed mesh. We actually uh, implemented our own little um, fixed mesh requirement uh, code here. Uh, that uh, then evolves to the full um, nonlinear Einstein and it uses the SSN as the name implies. So this is targeted towards a physical system where the matter is warping the space time significantly and thus cannot be treated in either the Newtonian limit or in a fixed background space time. So for example, neutral star Binary new star mergers, new star black hole binaries, and, and so on. Or creation disk around black hole and stuff like that. So, uh, as I said, this is uh, based on, on uh, particle methods. So, it's a Lagrangian code. So, uh, most other relativistic hydrodynamics codes are, oops, are there. Uh, are uh, Eulerian, where quantities are attached to uh, fixed grid points, and the change of quantity of a fixed, at a fixed grid point is just given by the partial derivative there. And of course, here the one potential problem is that the resolution is determined only by where you actually put your grid. So if you don't have grid points, then uh, if the matter moves somewhere else, uh, you have to adapt. And that means that it's pretty hard to adapt to changing geometries. On the other hand, a Lagrangian uh, approach, the quantities are attached to particles that move around with the fluid. And so you have to uh, change your, 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 your time derivative to be the full time derivative like that. And, and the 
one of the main advantages is that the resolution follows where the particle goes. So wherever you have a bunch of particles, you automatically have high resolution. And it's uh, easy to adapt to changing geometries. Of course, that advantage gets diluted a bit when you actually couple it to a space-time grid, uh, but <laughs> uh, at least that's uh, one of the one, one advantage of, of, of advancing. Question. Yep. Would it, um, does the trajectory of the particles, their accumulation at one point, give you a good idea where you want to refine? Yes. Okay. It does. So it can actually help you in, in determining where you want to put your grid. Our grid is not that dynamic yet, but uh, in principle, you can. So um, another important thing to consider is you know, another reason why we need another kind of relativistic kind of code is um, it just think of the case of a binary neutral star merger. And we know from the famous uh, uh, merger W TW 170817 that uh, where we, for the first time, actually had a uh, multi-messenger um, event, uh, including gravitational waves. Uh, that's uh, such binaries will produce both gravitational waves and uh, electromagnetic electromagnetic magnetic counterparts. And so we know that the gravitational waves are produced by the bulk matter motion, uh, whereas the electromagnetic radiation are produced by a small amount of matter that gets ejected from, from the main system. And this can be uh, of the order of 1% of, of the matter. Um, and one of the things that Eulerian codes have problems with is the uh, it, essentially based on uh, on the numerical methods used high resolution caption streams schemes is that they have oops, have issues oops, um, have issues with the surface of stars and so uh, typically you have to employ a, a sort of a low density artificial atmosphere around a uh, around a neutral star. And uh, this can also, the surface can also lead to unphysical outflows of low density materials. And um, and when you have this atmosphere around, if you have some ejected material that moves away and gets, gets to low and lower density, eventually it might, uh, it will get to, to, the, to, to the level of the atmosphere and then it just gets diluted and you can't really follow. And in order to really understand these multi messenger events that hopefully we'll see many more of in the coming years, um, it's very uh, uh, important to accurately describe this ejector that, 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 that moves out in order to make a connection between the gravitational wave signals and the electromagnetic particles. And so uh, not to uh, to, 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 to shame anybody, but uh, this is just a, 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 a plot I found in a paper and any, any code, any Eulerian code could produce something similar to that, where you have, um, you have a binary neutral star here, initial data, and then as soon as you start evolving it because of this atmosphere and the problems at the, at the neutral star surfaces, you start to see some material between the neutral stars. And much of that material uh, will be sort of artificial and, and not really related to, to the physics going on. Um, so this was, uh, I just found this uh, uh, nice looking plot in, in the paper by, by David Patrick, John Whistle and Natalia Atze. Um, but just to give you a flavor of, 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 of what what we, we can we can do with a Lagrangian code is uh, if it's not exactly the same system, it's a different equation of state, but um, in our simulations of, of a similar system, and, and, and I made sure to to make the uh, the, uh, the scale, the logarithmic scale of the density the same, you see that uh, as the new stars are moving around, 
there's no material between the stars at all. It's only when they actually get into contact where you start seeing a little bit of, of material gets ejected. Um, the strange looking lobes here is mostly because of the of the uh, of the visualization tool used and the fact that there's a, only a few particles. So what they what, what uh, the there's a long a, a long last distance between them. Well, I mean, there will be a difference because they are different systems. It's not exactly the same system. Well, they were both equal mass, but they were different masses, different equations of state. Uh, so uh, it, it, this was just to show that, uh, or to compare the um, uh, the stuff between the between the neutral stars here. It would be really nice to see something with the identical, you know, parameters. Yes. At some point, we'll get to that. Okay. <laughs> um, but just to to convince you uh, that uh, this this strange looking lobes here, I can also plot the same where I don't actually color uh, the things or the density, uh, but just show the indiv individual particles that we actually have. And uh, you can probably see that there are some particles around here, but but the, the density is quite low. But um, it, it all happens naturally. And also over here, you just see a few particles that have been started to be ejected from, from, from the central system. Um, so as I also mentioned it earlier, the lines of codes are good adapting to changing geometries. And so I'm going to show you a little movie here of a, um, a a simulation that my collaborator made, not using full GR, but uh, just Newtonian GR and just a couple of white dwarfs. Um, oh, well, a white dwarf around a black hole where the, the, the white dwarf gets uh, tidally, tidally disrupted or partially tidally disrupted, actually. So there's actually a stellar core surviving. So let me just... Oh, oh, that's the wrong one. So you have the white ball coming in, getting 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 entirely disrupted, but there's a core uh, surviving here. You can see the scales are changing as the as the matter is 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 is, is moving in in the background space time there. And you can see that it sort of walks around the, uh, the black hole again, and then simply this will intersect over here. And I think doing this with the with a Eulerian code would be would be pretty hard. You have to work hard to have the grid um, adapt to, to, to something like that. So let's just see that again. I'm sorry, what was the physical startup again? It's a, it's a white dwarf that gets tightly, dis, uh, tightly, tightly disrupted by a black hole. The black hole is at the origin. Where's the white dwarf? That's the black hole, right? No, that's the white dwarf. Oh, that's the white dwarf. Where's the black hole? The black hole is at 0.0. .0. Oh, okay. All right. It's uh, black. Well, so, uh, <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's up here right now. And there's still a, a, a core of the of the white dwarf is still gravitational bound here. So, and, and but as I said, once you actually couple this to full GR with uh, with a with a bit of code uh, with a space time evolution, of course you lose some of these advantages. But I, I, I thought that this was a pretty nice nice. Uh, oh, so this is not a relative. Uh... This is not relativity. The the, the self gravity of the white dwarf is Newtonian. So, so there's no grid here. Uh, you can just calculate the Newtonian potential based on the particle locations. Okay, so you just do a sum. Yeah.
So in the past, there has been HPH code used in astrophysics, but they have typically been limited to, as in this case, Newtonian gravity or, or, uh, or static background space-time or the quantum or flat approximation to general relativity. And so as far as I know, uh, this, this the code we have been wrote is the first that has done full TR with SPH. So what is the idea behind smooth particle hydrodynamics? The basic idea is that you replace the fluid by a finite set of particles. So instead of discretize your, uh, your, your, your matter on a grid, you say, okay, let me just divide it into into a different a finite set of particles. And we try to keep the uh, particle masses to be about the same so that not, uh, not too much of a discrepancy between them. And those particles are then allowed to move the, the local fluid velocities. And in order to then con uh, calculate uh, smooth um, uh, uh, Quantities like the density, you can say, okay, we I know where there's a particle there, there, there. So what is the, the density at a given at a given particle? And of course, you have to do then uh, do a um, an average over a certain set of neighbors, and this is done with a uh, a, a smoothing kernel function uh, with a what we call a smoothing length h. Uh, so essentially this picture shows here, you give more weight to particles that are close to your particle, um, the, the particle you're interested in, and then eventually you don't actually see the, uh, the remaining of the particles. Um, so this uh, smoothing kernel function then is used to recover sort of the smooth variables like density and so on, and, uh, and also to calculate gradients. Yeah. So, uh, like you edge, like the very outer particles, the kernel here, does that change the kernel function? No, you just use. Question, please. Oh, yeah. So, uh, the question was what we do uh, at the surface of the star, and nothing special happens there. Uh, you just use the, the, the number of particles that, are, of course, in this case, will just be on the ins inside of it. Uh, but there's nothing special to be done. And that is one of the reasons why we don't actually have any problems with the actual surface. So in, in some sense, the, the, the surface gets like smoothed out a bit because of, of the, the, the surface part with have a, having a finite smoothing length. Um, but um, uh, nothing special happens there. <coughs> yep. Maybe a follow up question. Um, what do you want to do in SPH code if I was and you have to repeat the question. Yes. So Roland was asking what we would do in in, in SPH code if we were looking at something like a crust of a of a neutral star. And I must admit that I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. Uh, we haven't we haven't talked about stuff like that yet. Um, so, as I said, uh, matter is described as particles with a mass m. Uh, so the A index here is labeling all our particles. Um, and then the density is calculated as a, as a weighted average over uh, um, neighbors using this uh, smoothing uh, kernel function. Uh, so it depends on the distance between the two particles and the um, smoothing lengths that have been assigned to, to particle A. And so outside of the smooth links, the contribution is zero. When the distance is smaller than A, uh, you get a contribution and you get a larger contribution uh, in, in, in the distance is smaller. And in the Newtonian limit, the equations can be derived from a Lagrangian. Uh, so essentially just the kinetic energy plus the internal energy from Ignoring here uh, the gravitational uh, uh, potential. And uh, from this Lagrangian, you can just do the, do the normal thing and then come up with the, uh, um, the, the evolution equations for the velocities and the, and the internal dimensions. 
and they all have this these kinds of this forms here where you where you sum over a bunch of particles uh, neighboring particles weighted with the with the kernel function and the you can also these grad a of the kernel functions will then give you the derivatives of the of the of the quantities you are in. So fairly simple stuff once you go through all the math. Um, many people think that HPH is very dissipative and very bad. Um, uh, and that is actually true if you just do the most naive implementation of it. It will be very dissipative. Uh, but uh, my co colleague uh, or collaborator, Stefan Watsburg, uh, has studied this extensively and come up with various things to, to make things uh, very, very um, accurate. So, of course, you can play around with your kernel choice. And some kernels have more have, uh, better properties than others. And uh, for example, uh, most people start out using something called standard uh, uh, cubic spline kernels. And these result in a lot of noise. They don't have too many neighbors. So when particles move in and out, you get jumps in your in your in your density averages. And but if you use kernels that you use more neighbors and then reduce that noise significantly. Uh, but of course, since you have to sum over all your neighbors that are inside the, uh, the, the smooth links of the kernel. Uh, you have to, uh, this comes at a larger computational cost. And we do have to add some dissipation to the code in order to, to handle shocks. And uh, those uh, typically depends on differences in particle velocity. So if you have uh, two particles coming together at high speeds, you should, you, you, you are mostly, most likely encountering a shock and you have to add some, some dissipation in order to handle that. Uh, but Stefan has also found ways of of of, um, of uh, reducing the effect of that extra dissipation that you artificial dissipation you have there. For example, you can use uh, like people are doing in Eulerian dynamics, slow limiting reconstruction to the midpoint between particles to um, uh, to reduce the dissipation in smooth areas of flow. And you can also track entropy, entropy generation uh, and steer your dissipation parameters so that they turn on when you have a lot of entropy, entropy generating, uh, but not otherwise. And so with all those best bells and whistles, uh, it actually uh, turns out that, uh, that uh, smooth part of quantum mechanics can be actually be made quite, quite accurate. So just to show you here, uh, we have a couple of kernels that we particularly like. Um, the green one, or the, the, the purple one here is called the, the Bentland C6 kernel. And that was one that Stefan was using for a long time because um, it had very nice properties. Um, one thing is that if you actually take the Fourier transform of that, uh, the Fourier transform is positive as well. And that means that you avoid some uh, some uh, instability, pairing instabilities that that can otherwise happen. Uh, the green kernel kernel is 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 a higher order kernel that gives higher accuracy in your density estimates, uh, but it's not uh, the Fourier transform is not positive, uh, so uh, it could potentially be um, uh, uh, suspect to 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 some of these pairing instabilities that can be worrisome. But in practice, we don't really see that. I'm sorry, Q is the radius? Or... Uh, well, Q is the, dis yeah, the, the distance from uh, between the two particles in units of the, uh, of the smooth lengths. OK. So it, was, it was, would be the RAB that I had in, in the previous slide. Um, and so Stefan, uh, so been doing a lot of experiments and found that, for example, the VHH kernel, the purple here, requires about 220 uh, neighbors in order to give uh, good density estimates. Uh, and so what we can do is we can 
dynamically adjust the smooth lengths of each particle. So it has exactly 220 particles um, in, in, in its neighborhood uh, that are within the smoothing length. And, uh, and, and that's how we, we, well, we adjust the, 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 the smoothing length parameter uh, uh, as we go along. Yeah. Repeat the question. What's the meaning of kernel? Yes. Well, so the, the, the kernel, I mean, is, uh, so the question is, what, what is the kernel? And, and so the kernel is this mathematical function that has certain properties, namely that it should, uh, if you, so, so these are what we call radial kernels where the Q here is the radius between uh, the radial distance between the, 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 the two points you're looking at. And uh, it should be the, if you take the integral of the kernel function over from uh, over the, the, the region where the smooth leg is non zero, you should get one so that it it's, it's normalized. And then it should uh, be something that that has a maximum at the origin. And, uh, and and otherwise uh, just goes to zero uh, so that you don't add contributions from particles further away. So essentially, it's, it's just a, a function that gives more weight to particles that are close to you and less weight to, to particles that are far away, but with some nice mathematical properties. So, what I showed you before for HDH was in the in the Newtonian limits and in the relativistic limits, you can also write down a uh, Lagrangian, which makes it a bit more complicated up here. Uh, again, you have this, you, you have the stretch energy, the stretch energy tends to the four velocities and the square root of the determinant. Uh, but again, from that you can crank the uh, the the the, the um, the, the usual uh, methods of, of generating equations of motions and define the canonical momentum and canonical energy per unit mass by just taking derivatives of the quantum with respect to, to uh, your variables. And uh, what you end up is with is equations that look exactly the same as the Newtonian case, except that uh, these uh, the eyes here, uh, where that used to be just the, the, the gradient of the, of the kernel, now has uh, uh, terms in, involving the, the metric. And then you get these additional terms at the end of it, that again, it depends on the, on the metric, which are the, essentially takes into account the, the gravity acceleration. Um, and so we, we, we can define like you do in Eulerian hydrodynamics, some evolved variables. And, uh, and in this case, those are the, well, actually, for, first of all, you can, you can measure uh, or calculate the, the, the computing frame density from the location of your, your particles in your coordinate space. Uh, and, then, uh, and then you can, we cover the, 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 the rest frame density and so on uh, from your evolved variables. And so we, again, we, we have, like you have in normal Eulerian hydrodynamics, we have to do a recovery of the, of the, um, of the, the primitive variables from the evolved variables. But that is all the same. The subscript A there, like on GA, that is? That is the, the, the determinant of the metric at particle A. At particle A, okay. So that's not a, a space time index. Right, right. No, no, I was just, I, I, I realized it couldn't be a space time index. I was guessing it was probably the particle. Okay. But the I is a space time index, right? Uh, so yes. Coordinate index. Yes. So the convention must be like ABC is particles. And yes. <laughs> and IJK is, is, is space time or space okay. indices. Yeah. But we've also got new and new. Yeah, so so because those are actually four dimensional sums over here. Right. So, yeah. <laughs> it might be a bit of use of notation, but uh, right, no, no, but it's just just to be clear, there's three different types of indices. Yes. 
Uh, so here I've highlighted, I highlighted in red the, the places where the metric enters um, the, 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 uh, the SP8 equations. And so we, we do need to get uh, the, the, the metric and its first space and time derivatives at the location of the particles in order to be able to, to have the right hand size of the, of the particle variables. Uh, so now we come to BSN. So BSN, we treat like any other uh, codes. Uh, we put it on a grid. Uh, and we use finite differencing. Well, not everybody does that, but you know, it's not necessary to do that, but that's what we do. Um, we use the standard one plus large slicing and gamma driver shifts that are known in everything else. But just to summarize the equations, uh, we uh, in the BSN equations, you introduce the conforming metric, which is e to the minus four pi times the physical metric. Um, and you do that so that the determinant of this one, this the conforming metric is one. And additionally, you do a trace decomposition of the uh, of the adjacent to curvature um, and a conformal re rescaling of the traceless part uh, as normal. And then you introduce the uh, contracted Christoffel symbols, introduce as if they were all variables um, to uh, make us a standard piece. Yeah. I'm sure we'll talk more about this and during the, this, uh, this workshop. So I, I thought I would keep this uh, kind of short and just sort of show, show the equations here for all their glory. Well, not all their glory, because we'll have to make sure to to uh, to to um uh, to write that out into into a specific indices eventually when you actually want to code it up. But one what I want just want to highlight here is of course that the in the equation for the a tilde you have matter terms. In the equation for the trace of k you have matter terms and in the equation for the contracted conformal um, you also have uh, matter terms here. So that means that in order to 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 calculate the right hand sides for the space time uh, 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 variables, you do need to know what the matter is doing at at the grid points. And of course, we don't actually have the matter at the grid points at this point, but we get to that. So. As I said, matter information is available on the particles. Metric information is available only on the grid. I'm sorry. Could, could you back up a couple of slides? One more. One more. So, so you have these S quantities that you evolved. Um, does this mean you did, by the way, you had. That's the canonical momentum. Right. Those are the evolution equations. That means you don't have to have this. On the prim kind of thing that everybody else has. No, no, we, we do because we. Uh, okay. So, so are you still okay. we, we, we still have the pressure here, and 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 uh, and in what we measure is the. Uh, um, okay, but you still have that. That's yeah, yeah. We, we still have the step of where we have to recover the the, the derivative from the evolved okay. variables. So, uh, so this is this is actually one of the points where we, we have to spend a lot of time in order to get things right and get things accurate. And uh, so it has changed a lot from the first version of the code. Um, so the, the mapping from particles to grids is the most complicated part, uh, uh, essentially because the particles are distributed uh, non-uniformly. And so you have to, Figure out a way of getting uh, uh, quantities mapped accurately from a set of non-uniform points to um, whatever grid point you're interested. In. And so the current scheme that we have uses what we call a local regression estimate in combination with something we call a multi-dimensional optimal order detection scheme. <laughs> Some mouthful. Um, but the main idea is 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 is, is very simple. 
you have a grid point here and you have a bunch of particles around it. And so what you can do is you can expand the quantity that you know at the, all the particle locations in a Taylor expansion around the, around the grid points. And so you, you get the quantity is, is equal to the quantity at grid point plus the derivatives of the grid point times the distance and so on. And then uh, because you have more particles than unknowns, the, the unknowns here are the, are, the, the, are, the, are the value at the grid point and the derivatives of the grid point. 10 uh, minutes. Uh, you can uh, you can expand out uh, 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 and you, you can you when you have more points you can use linear regression to solve for, for these quantities uh, to different polynomial orders depending on what you, what you, what you, what you want. Then you can evaluate uh, this function that you have on the grid points and measure the error based on the value that you know is existing there. And then uh, and you can weight that by, by the distance of the grid point using one of these kernel functions. And, and then you can choose the order that has the smallest error estimate in order to get things as accurate. So that's the main idea. We, we calculate these at different orders and then we look at the errors and then uh, choose the one with, with the best uh, error. Unfortunately, that doesn't quite work near the surface of the star. So we need another way of detecting the surface of the star. And uh, we, we came up with this expression here. So if you take the, the, uh, uh, take the divergence of the radius vector, you should get three. And so if we calculate this using uh, an SPA estimate near the surface uh, or everywhere, uh, you should get a value that is close to three. So we, if we construct this quantity here, um, then that should be uh, that should be close to zero. Um, and it is if you actually measure that most of the places except near the surface of the star. And this is exactly what we want. We wanted to, to get an estimate of where the where the surface of the star is. And so we can we can look at this, uh, and then where this error estimate is above a certain point, we can go and say, okay, let's lose, use the lowest order uh, uh, linear regression results for that point, because otherwise you might get a bit really stuck. The mapping from the, of the metric and its derivative from the grid to the particles are, done, are simply done by, by fifth order pyramid interpolation. So standard, uh, well, not quite standard, but almost standard, uh, Polynomial interpolation. So here's the, um, the, the the schematic of the algorithm for taking one time step. So first, we have to convert from the SN variables to physical metric. Then we have to map that physical metric from the grid to the particles. Then we have to update the neighbor tree that uh, that is used to calculate the uh, uh, to figure out which neighbors to 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 um, to, uh, to include in your in, in your sums to get get the smooth smooth uh, smooth variables, and then you can then calculate the local rest frame density. Then you recover the physical height of variables from the more variables. Then you can calculate t mu nu and map that from the particles to the grid. Now you can calculate the time derivatives of the metric variables on the grid. And then you can map the metric acceleration terms from the grid to the particles. And then you can finally calculate the time derivatives of the hydro variables on the particles. And then you can figure out, okay, which of the, is the hydro or the Vincent equation the most restrictive in terms of time step uh, and choose the, the one that has the, the smallest uh, uh, time step requirement. And then you can update the hydro and metric state, uh, metric state vector based on, on this time. And then all the particles move, and then you just repeat. Oh, yeah. Did that vary from the part paper? Yeah. The accuracy of the update. You have to update the smoothing Yes. The smoothing lengths, I think it's doing this update of the neighbor tree gets updated so that 
that we have exactly the, the right number of particles in and this. And that will be done for every particle, yeah. Uh, so just to show you um, a, a test application, especially with a specific shock tube, um, you have a high density, high pressure matter in one side, low density, low pressure on the other side. Uh, this doesn't actually have any uh, GR, uh, but uh, it's done with the full GR code with just the metric set to, to Minkowski. And you can see that uh, the, uh, the code Five minutes. is able to track the, um, the, uh, the, um, the exact solution quite well. But it was just a, uh, something that we, we needed to, to, to do in order to show that we can actually do shops. Uh, second application was just uh, take a stable uh, TOV star, uh, put it on our, uh, put the metric on our grid, and come up with a, a distribution of particles to represent the uh, the density and the pressure uh, structure of the star. Uh, here we just use a, a, a polytropic pressure state with uh, gamma equals two, uh, this mass, and so on, because that was something where could compare something with in the, 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 the known stuff in the, in, the, in the literature. And so once you let it go, uh, some, uh, uh, there's uh, some, oh, sorry. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Eric. Uh, there's some, uh, uh, some uh, numerical uh, error, of course, uh, location error. People online can't see where you're pointing. Yeah, I know. Okay. Uh, but I can't do it in both places. Yeah. Um, and so you see that uh, we've done evolutions here with 500k particles, 1 million and 2 million particles. With the full space time evolution here, and you see that the, um, uh, the, the uh, oscillation or amplitude of the oscillations decrease with resolution. And if you take a spectrum, uh, then we see quite clear peaks at the expected uh, frequencies uh, the, of the icon modes of the, of, the, of the star on the metal mode and up to, well, it's just see it barely a trace of the, of the fifth harmonic mode, but uh, at least you see that. And uh, what I also wanted to show that after evolving this uh, neutral star for, for, uh, for uh, almost 30 milliseconds, it's a long time in, in, in this is the particle distribution so you can see we still have a very well defined uh, particle fusion that doesn't do anything strange near the near the surface of the star and we also see uh, so the in the black we show the initial density profile the density as a function of radius and at t equals 30 we see that it has hardly not changed at all uh, of course, there's some oscillations, so it will, and, and some of particles have moved away from the initial position. But again, everything is, is, is nice and, 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 and stable and uh, no problems with the surface. And I should also mention that here, I am showing all the particles, um, so there's no particles that are off or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, repeat the question. Yeah. So the question is, if we see any uh, contraprem failure, and in, in this simulation, not. Once we have uh, start collapsing to a black hole, if we don't actually uh, increase the grid resolution, we will see it because things get unphysical. But as long as we keep the grid resolution compatible with the with the particle density, uh, then uh, we, we we don't see any problem. I should then go here and just give you a flavor of what it, the code can do by showing this movie here. So this is going to be a binary neutral star with two 1.5 solar mass stars with the APR3 piecewise polytropic equation of state. Um, and you see, we just 
move around, move around, move around. And everything merges and part the black hole forms, collapses. We start removing particles. And uh, at the end, uh, maybe a few thousand particles left, starting from like 2 million particles. Um, and some of them actually gets actually ejected uh, with this a very small amount of matter here, but um, but uh, the code can can handle it. But of course, in order to really get that accurately, we probably need to do simulations with more particles. Yeah. And then. Uh, we can also do final new star mergers with long-lived remnants. So if we just decrease the, the mass a little bit here, at least with this version of the code, uh, we can actually uh, have a, a stable, uh, a long-lived stable remnant. Um, so let me just go and show you that movie. Again, I point you to the fact that there's nothing going on between the stars. And then we, at some point we start developing uh, uh, L equals one asymmetries that, that grow. Those are, I think, expected uh, instabilities that makes things look like wobbly here. Um, And in this case, eventually, um, the uh, the, um, the black hole actually um, uh, it after a while, this in this simulation, a black hole actually does form. But after like um, fifteen in milliseconds, And I, I found that it was useful for to to uh, for, for this case to actually look at the velocity as a function of radius. Um, and so you can see uh, there seems to be sort of two different phases of ejection of high velocity material happening. Uh, there's this first leading phase and then the second one. And there's a few more in here. Um, and in this case, in, in this case, only about uh, uh, seven times 10 to the minus four solar masses actually escape. But some of it actually escapes with uh, velocities that are close to 80% uh, of the speed of light. And I, I also made a movie with, with this. So initially, he, we, we have the nuclear star just warping a bit. And then we have the first addiction, second addiction, as the star oscillates and material comes in and hits that and then moves out again. Just pause it here. You see it's ejected a pretty accelerated to pretty high velocities here. And then the have the same, uh, uh, the second contraction phase here. I found that pretty cool. And I should probably. Go to the last frame, no, the last. slide and uh, talk a little bit about the artwork and further developments. And one of one things that we need to get done is to do um, a distributed memory polarization of the code, because currently it's only an MP parallel, and that limits to uh, the, the number of particles we can actually go to, um, because the runs take quite a long time then. Uh, 
I would also like to add an actual account horizon finding to the code itself, so I don't have to read it into Cactus afterwards and and, and uh, use the uh, account horizon finder direct there. Um, we need support for more equations of states. Uh, currently, we have uh, polytropic and piecewise polytropic, but Stefan is currently working on separate equations of states, and we can do more interesting things. We would also like to have sort of an improved matching of the numerical method of escaping particles with a background uh, space time to continue evolution. Because we have a grid, we have a limited uh, region that is covered by the grid, and when the particles get to the boundary of that, we want to just map them to a background space time and then continue evolving them uh, so that we can follow the, the outflow to F for long times. Uh, we have done some work there, uh, but we, we need to improve uh, what we're doing. We also need neutrino transports because we, of course, need to know what happens with neutrinos. We need to know how the electron fraction of the escaping material in order to produce reliable uh, light curves. And, uh, there's probably a lot of other things we need to do, but uh, this is what I have to do. Up here. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah, well, we have a lot of questions on the way. We allowed you for 15 minutes for questions, so hopefully that's more than enough. Yes, we wait. Is it easy to add magnetic fields? Uh, I don't think, so. well, I don't know actually. Uh, I, I know that. I, I think Stefan has some ideas on how to do it, but uh, I, I don't know how difficult it would be myself personally. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, I think uh, Stefan's priority is, is to get the tabulated equation of state and neutrinos done so we can follow the, the that kind of physics better um, before looking into magnetic fields. I don't have it here, but, but so, so she was asking uh, if we have an angular profile of the of the uh, of the uh, ejected material. Uh, I know that Stefan has looked at it, and I think he found that the uh, first burst that we see that comes directly from the from the initial collision uh, seems to be uh, more uh, more in the equatorial plane. Uh, Whereas the second phase, where you actually get five minutes, please conclude. Of the uh, of the of the of the of the hypermassive core is more isotropic, um, but it, it's something we need to look into more. That would definitely be interesting, yeah. I suspect that, I mean, they probably have just have tracer particles that are, are moving with the local fluid speed. And I think that would also be affected by, by the atmosphere. Um, so, uh, uh, but yeah, it could be interesting to look at. Okay, so 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 the question is, did the code crash when when the uh, when the black holes form? And the the answer is no. Um, as long as what uh, as we add more refinement levels as the particles move in, then eventually they get far enough inside that it's safe to actually remove the particles. Uh, so at some point we well we do it actually in two stages where we first convert the particles to dust once they get far enough in so that they just keep going with uh, with geodesic motion. 
And then once they get even further in, then we finally start to remove them. And when we do that, we can actually evolve the black hole afterwards safely on, on, on our grid when, and when there's only a trace set of particles flying around somewhere. Or sometimes all the particles actually go into the black hole. All right, I think I'm gonna stop the questions there. So that Ruth has time to set up. And any other questions, you know, Peter will be around at the break and we can interact. And I will be here the rest of the week as well. And he'll be here the rest <laughs> of the week. His flight does to the second floor doesn't leave before that. So let's thank him. <laughs>